Playing for Keeps, presented by Jiffy Lou. With the voice, Milt Thompson. Delivering the best of sports programming. Interviews with top celebrities. And the answer to the question, where are they now? And now, Milt Thompson, Playing for Keeps. Good evening and welcome again to Playing for Keeps. I am your host, The Voice, Milt Thompson, here on WHMB Channel 40. Thank you so much for viewing us these last couple of weeks, and we're going to continue to bring you the best in sports programming in the central Indiana area and around the state. And when you're watching, go tap your friends and tell them, we got to tune in to that Playing for Keeps show. They're getting so much useful and helpful information about what's going on around our world. And we've had a couple shows uh, already in the can. One of them was, you've heard about, uh, where are they now? And that was in the form of uh, former baseball, basketball great Ray Tolbert. And uh, for that, we learned a little bit from Ryan Vaughn, um, who is Indiana Sports Corporation, the guru, about how it is they were able to pull off not only a Super Bowl, but eventually an entire March Madness proposition. Now, that takes a lot of savvy, a lot of where, wherewithal, and a lot of folks getting behind the whole program. Well, we've been very fortunate in central Indiana to not only grow some organizations from the ground room and the grassroots up, but to also expand them to not only be uh, a local person's um, baby, if you call it that way, or maybe even an organization, but to ultimately become institutionalized into the fabric of all of sport. I know we talked about amateur sport. We talked about some professional sports. We're talking about all sports when you get on Playing for Keeps. Well, teeing up today's show, uh, being its World Series time of the year, uh, getting off into uh, uh, late October, early November, uh, we're going to talk about baseball. We're going to talk about, about, a, about the amateur baseball program here in central Indiana uh, called uh, Play, Play Ball Indiana, and we're going to do that with its executive director, who is Mike Lennox, my good friend. And Mike, um, we're going to dive into an interview here in just a few moments, but we're going to take a real quick break and come right back with Playing for Keeps on WHMB Channel 40. Playing for Keeps, presented by Jiffy Lou. Playing for Keeps, presented by Jiffy Lou. Welcome back to Playing for Keeps. I am your host, the voice Milt Thompson. And keep on watching, will you? Get your friends and neighbors to watch every Friday evening at 9 p.m. We're going to have a complete sports lineup on those Fridays, and you're going to enjoy them all. Well, today we're going to talk about baseball, softball. Talking about that little round thing with a stick on it. That's, I know a little bit something about because that's where I kind of got my roots in, in athletics. And we're going to do that in the way with the executive director of Playball Indiana, Mike Lennox, my good friend. Mel, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Well, you're welcome to be here. And I'm so glad you uh, took a little time out of your busy schedule because I know you're already planning. It's a year-round thing as you're planning. But tell us a little about the history of the old Indiana Amateur Baseball Association and and uh, how it, uh, it is that you got involved in it and when, and then for how long have you been carrying on this proposition? <laughs> well, it goes back to the days and to your trunk of your car when you started this organization in 1982, uh, kind of with a challenge to get the young men that were playing high school ball to play during the summer and kind of stay out of trouble uh, during the summer when they could be getting into mischief. And at the time, you were a deputy prosecutor and some of these guys you were seeing in court and you kind of told them you'd rather see them stealing second base than cars. And so for the first several years, the organization was all a high school summer program. And uh, I came on board in 1996, just finishing my 25th year with this. And at that point... Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> You've put up with this organization for 26 years? Or vice versa. Okay, <laughs> there you go. And uh, uh, shortly after I started, uh, the need was pretty apparent that the middle school kids needed a lot of help as well. So that's when we started kind of aging downward to, to reach into the younger age groups, and that's also when we started softball. Well, uh, there were some growing pains, as there are with any kind of fledgling organization, uh, dealing with uh, board of directors, uh, mm -hmm. most of whom, if I recall, were um, high school and college uh, baseball coaches. 
correct? Um, in, in, involved with faculty meetings, I'm certain, but I'm not certain about governance of uh, nonprofit organizations. Tell us about the status of the organization and, and how it has emerged and uh, had, actually you had to kind of almost close the doors once upon a time and, uh, and to reimagine ourselves. Tell us about that process. That's true. Uh, as you mentioned, the board was very baseball coach oriented, uh, very good at the X's and O's of the sport, but not so great at what it took to run an organization. And uh, in the early years, we managed to grow the program to 400 teams and 5,000 kids. But we realized at the same time that we were so focused in the suburbs and out in the outlying areas that we had created a donut hole in the middle of the city where we were really at a mission to serve. And so it was in the early 2000s when the organization, uh, a couple of very courageous board members suggested, you know, we need to reinvent this thing and get it back on the mission of serving inner city kids. And so that's when we changed the name from Indiana Amateur Baseball Association, which sounded like playing baseball after work with a case of beer on the line, to Playball Indiana, which said, boys, girls, all ages, and literally overnight went from 5,000 kids to 150 kids, which were all IPS kids. And all those other teams went off and continued to play every summer and have continued to do so. But since then, we've been able to grow it back to 2,000 kids, but they're almost all inner city kids. Well, that's a miraculous challenge to, to go from a large scope of that, and I'm certain a lot of the resources that they had and uh, would probably go with them. Uh, and there was always a little problem with equity about how it is we give the same opportunities that perhaps you and I had uh, growing up in suburban areas and uh, being able to play from a young age. Uh, and we both know that, that skill is very, very difficult if you start too late. Uh, you can't be afraid of a ball if, if you're going to play the sport. Uh, you've got to learn it earlier on, and when other folks are learning it earlier on, and you not learning it, it's going to be difficult to compete. So what's the process of changing the culture of an organization like that before we get into how the, the organization is actually supported? Well, it's interesting. Uh, I could tell you a funny story, something I witnessed watching an IPS game, Indianapolis Public Schools. This was a middle school game. These were 13, 14 year old guys. And they're playing on a full size diamond. And a lot of these kids had not played much baseball. In, in many cases, they were playing it for the first time. And I remember watching these kids throw the ball around in between innings. And there's a boy standing out in left field and he's literally standing at the warning track. And he knows it's time to throw the ball in to get the inning started. And he's trying to get somebody's attention uh, in the first base dugout. And finally, the coach says, just throw it, meaning to just throw the ball, let it hit around the first base line. It'll roll towards the dugout. Well, he threw it on a frozen rope from left field. It went into the dugout on the fly uh, between the little screens and the, and the roof of the dugout, ricocheted around a few times, knocked some helmets over. Everybody dove for cover. And I looked and said, that kid just threw a ball 320 feet. What a heck of an athlete. And so, and you quickly ran to find if you can get a contract for every young man to be signed up. <laughs> we'll teach you how to play with, with tools like that. But that's kind of the challenge that you find with, with kids, like you mentioned, Milt, that don't start playing when they're six or seven. They're, they don't have the nuances of the game down. They have the athleticism down. And baseball is kind of a hard, hard sport to learn at first because you don't know all the little things that you're supposed to be doing, whereas football or some of the other sports are more instinct, instinctual. This one, sometimes you have to kind of think what you're doing. So we kind of started to work with IPS and other coaches to try to teach these kids more basics. And a lot of that came from being part of the Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities program where we got a lot of resources. Well, tell me about that. Reviving Baseball in Inner Cities sounds highfalutin uh, <laughs> to be a part of uh, a nonprofit organization, uh, a local one. Well, it, it's interesting. When, when, uh, when I joined the organization in 1996, one of the first things we did, a board member suggested, hey, I read about this RBI program that Major League Baseball is getting started. And so we signed up to, to be an affiliate. And we were one of the first ones in the country to be an affiliate. And at the time, there were maybe 50 of them around the country. And this is a program that Major League Baseball sponsors. And so 
we joined it 25 years ago, and now there's 250 RBI cities around the world, and it's a very, very large program. And Major League Baseball puts a lot of money into trying to get kids to play baseball in the inner city where there aren't very many resources. Well, uh, not having resources uh, of large uh, suburban um, school kids that might be able to afford and support their baseball teams and user fees, all of a sudden you don't have those resources as a part of your program. How do you sustain such a program? Well, we've been very fortunate over the years to attract uh, support from a lot of foundations and companies. Lilly Endowment is probably our largest sponsor over the years. Uh, the Central Indiana Community Foundation has been very generous. Uh, we've received funding from Major League Baseball at times, so uh, a lot of them have done a lot of the heavy lifting. But on a local basis, the Indianapolis Indians have, have always been kind to us over the years. And it's interesting, over the last several years, they just kind of stepped up their support of us even more and more every year. And uh, you'd mentioned, uh, too, that uh, once you've gotten supported, sometimes finding uh, the young folks to be able to play. How do you go about finding these folks? A lot of times they find us. A lot of people want to play in a program where they can wear an MLB logo on their shirt. And the RBI logo has the MLB guy, the batting guy on it. And uh, uh, so that really is a distinction that a lot of kids want. Uh, but a lot of other kids play with us for a year or two and they really like it and they want to sign up and they bring more friends the next year. And, uh, and, of course, the coaches are the same way. So I would say the majority of the kids in our program are kind of word of mouth or been with us before. Well, sometimes we as organizers, um, sometimes we can neglect the real struggles of folks that uh, perhaps have uh, less resources around them. Uh, their schools don't support them. These are summertime programs in a lot of places. I remember a survey. Uh, that we had done one year to try to find out more about who our audiences were so that we could make a more compelling case to some of those foundations. Uh, and, and I remember a couple of young women. Tell, tell us about that story. It was a watershed moment. I, I still remember it distinctly. We were, we were doing a focus group of about 15, 16, 17-year-old young ladies that were playing in the RBI regional tournament in the softball division. And they were all kind of being interviewed, and, and they were all asked, well, if you weren't playing RBI softball, what would you be doing? And more than two or three of them said, well, I'd probably be pregnant or on drugs or, you know, I, I don't know what I'd be doing. And it was such a jaw-dropping set of responses that were not prompted. They, did, they were very spontaneous responses. And we thought, oh, my God, we have so much work to do to really focus on you know, who these young people are and what's going on in their lives. So from equity and having quality um, um, competitive baseball to now having to have wraparound services so that folks can think about more important things. It's a ministry in a lot of ways, uh, compatible with the kind of things that we talk about here uh, at Channel 40, that uh, uh, we're going to uh, uh, feed them, not just food, they're going to feed them uh, spiritually and physically and emotionally and uh, help their families and find opportunities out there for them. How do you make that conversion with your volunteers uh, who out there may not really recognize the difficulty that some people are having? It's, uh, it's an interesting process, and it's one that we work at every year to try to fine-tune. Uh, one of the things we, we always have to do is do background checks on our coaches to find out what's in their background to make sure they're compatible with being around our kids. And when they do that, we try to do workshops. We have a, a partnership with the Positive Coaching Alliance, which works with our coaches and parents to say, you know, Winning isn't the most important thing here. The most important thing is providing a very positive atmosphere for these young people that are in your charge. And in a lot of cases, it means some of these coaches are taking kids home, taking them out to eat, doing a lot more than just coaching a couple nights a week. Well, the challenge of Play Ball Indiana is not just how to play baseball, but is how do we live at life. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that uh, with our special guest, Mike Lennox of Playball Indiana on Playing for Keeps. We'll be right back. 
Playing for Keeps, presented by Jiffy Lube. Playing for Keeps, presented by Jiffy Lube. Welcome back to Playing for Keeps. I am your host, the voice, Milt Thompson, here on WHMB Channel 40. We've been uh, talking uh, with Mike Lennox, Executive Director of Playball Indiana, and uh, we were talking about uh, some of the challenges uh, of, of just living, not so of actually recreating, playing a sport that people are learning to play and hopefully learning to love. Uh, I knew I grew up learning to love it, and uh, part of my challenge getting this organization started was, was to uh, uh, find other like-minded people who were prepared to do it. But we were in there for the challenge of baseball, so we wanted to make sure we had competitive baseball, which would hopefully grow one day into what we have in competitive baseball, and now folks getting uh, drafted uh, from Central Indiana when there were very, very few before then. Uh, and, and while we're working with some of these young folks in, toward inner city uh, programs or even rural folks without, don't have the same sort of opportunities as others, uh, I remember uh, taking a field trip uh, on, on a bus out to Eagle Creek Reservoir. And uh, there were several, uh, the, at the time, park department uh, uh, youngsters are there and they're chaperones. And, and one guy was just so excited. I mean, he couldn't, he was so excited. And I said, young man, are you okay? Uh, what, what, why are you so excited? He says, I've never been to the ocean before. In fact, he'd never, <laughs> never been out of his local neighborhood, really, uh, outside of his school and his neighborhood was. So I understood the impact that we could have. Uh, and uh, you recognize that impact in, uh, by essentially inheriting the executive management of the program uh, where young people are getting experiences they probably would never, ever have had but for Playball Indiana. Talk a little bit about that and how that relates to travel. Well, that's a very interesting point you make, and I can remember the first year we participated in the RBI tournament was 1997, and we took two teams of boys up to Detroit to be in the RBI regional tournament. And we went up wearing hand-me-down pants, T-shirts, baseball caps, and we were playing kids with full Detroit Tiger uniforms, Minnesota Twin uniforms. We went up there and just got beat so bad. And when we were talking amongst ourselves, the adults, we just said, what are we thinking? Why are we even doing this? And then we did a really smart thing. We started listening to what the young men were saying. And they were more excited about this hotel they were in and this elevator that they had to go in and the chance that they go, went to go to Canada. And we pressed a little closer and found out that 80% that of these kids had never left the state of Indiana and 50% had never left the city of Indianapolis. We've heard things like that since. It's the first time I've ever seen a seagull. It's the first time I've ever seen the ocean. And these kinds of experiences really bring it back home. Well, um, uh, there's something about it that uh, has a spiritual connotation. Yes. And uh, I, I love baseball, as you well know. And I and, uh, and, uh, was a fair player uh, in my day. And uh, more than fair. But still serve uh, uh, on our uh, Indianapolis Indians Board of Directors. Uh, so I give my time uh, uh, to the professional side of it as well. And uh, uh, in my younger agency days, represented a few young players uh, uh, in fact, out of, at the time, Marion College, my very, very first uh, baseball client was uh, uh, Tom Linkmeyer ah. and uh, uh, became long, long time friends. But I learned things then, too, because Canadian money and being drafted by Toronto didn't translate to the things that I was even learning as a young uh, lawyer agent back then. Uh, but the, these are experiences that somehow even we take, take for granted. Uh, and, and if we're going to really be mentors, and you mentioned you, you've got to, you have to learn how to be a coach, and you have to be trained to be a coach. Uh, you have to also be uh, trained to be an official, uh, and uh, making sure that there's fairness and there's such things. What kind of lessons are we trying to impart uh, in, in, in addition to educational messages? I would say sportsmanship and fair team play are the two things that, that just drive it home every day. And we try to teach and show that you're not going to win every game. But you're not going to get anywhere by losing your temper and throwing your glove. You know, you got to get ready for life. And not everybody's going to make it to the big leagues. Hardly anybody is. But everybody can become a major league citizen. And so that's what we're trying to teach, that there's a lot more than just how you win or lose the game. Uh, 
I'm going to use that quote, um, everybody, everyone can become a major league citizen because unfortunately, uh, bumps in the road, uh, we have parents these days that perhaps haven't received that message. And what kind of example are they leaving and how it is we resolve some of those disputes before we can even be uh, in resolving disputes uh, amongst children. Uh, tell us a little bit about the challenges that may exist uh, uh, when folks are into it, um, perhaps uh, in an unhealthy way. Unfortunately, it happens a lot. And uh, when you're talking about folks that are in lower income areas, uh, maybe have a lot of stresses in their life that are maybe harder than some of us have, and they're trying to kind of relive their glory days, their youthful days through their kids. And when they see things happen at games that isn't exactly the way they want them to go, they misbehave at times. And so one of the things we are trying to do is teach our umpires to be better at deflating these kinds of things that happen at games. Don't go to jaw to jaw with a dad that's screaming over the fence. Just try to calm everybody down and say, hey, we're just here to play. Let's play ball. Let's have some fun here. And so the umpires are getting better at that. Uh, so that's a big step, trying to make things calmer at games. Mike, I know that there's uh, ongoing vision since we've kind of institutionalized the organization. We've got uh, great partnerships out there. Um, you, you've spent a lot of your time uh, writing grants as well as running programs as well as making sure others. Tell us about the, the, the staff uh, that you have, uh, the stipended folks that we work with, and, and how is that organization looking for its future? Well, my number two guy is Bob Haney. He's the head baseball coach at Tech High School, and he and I work hand-in-hand -hand with a, a group of uh, part-time people and a lot of volunteers. Uh, to try to drive this mission forward. Uh, right now, we're one of the largest RBI programs in the country that's not in a Major League Baseball city. And we are so fortunate to have the Indians help cheering us on. And with them kind of behind us, our goal is to be the largest RBI program in the country from a minor league city right. standpoint. Of well, I, I spoke with the uh, chairman of the board, Bruce Schott Schumacher, uh, uh, actually at the Moselle Sanders um, uh, a telethon that they had here uh, on Channel 40 and, uh, and will can be continuing to have. And I and, uh, was talking to Bruce about that ongoing support. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll have him on the show and we'll talk about uh, Indianapolis Indians uh, Charities, mm -hmm. uh, which has had uh, some, some, uh, uh, some good things happen to it. Uh, some other partners that you work with. You'd mentioned Major League Baseball. Uh, you'd mentioned, uh, I think, uh, uh, Cal Ripken Foundation, others. W tell us about how it is you uh, take off in the pursuit of those. Well, the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation sponsors a couple of programs we use. One is called Badges for Baseball, which pairs law enforcement folks with uh, kids so that kids are not afraid of first responders, but look at them as friends. So the, the PAL Club here in Indianapolis is a partner in that program. Uh, we're getting ready to kick off a new program called I'm Great, which is a girls' respect program for middle school girls. It's also sponsored by the Ripken Foundation. So, so, so you know, yeah, this is not something that we can just do without support, right? Right. So the folks that are watching this show right now, they'll know that they can reach out um, through various websites and otherwise and also be supportive as we're making young people uh, become major league citizens. Folks, Mike Lennox, Indiana, play ball. Indiana. Play ball Indiana. Thank you very much and we'll see you next week. <laughs>